helping refugees, <coughs> I think will be very interesting to hear from them. And Monta Data is here from the University of Richmond who has written about the United Nations and helped us getting this. We're trying to get a UN association started here in Richmond. And uh, here's another one of our organizers who will speak right after me, Uma Kenyatta is here, he just came in. Um, so we're trying to get a UN association because we want to strengthen the United Nations. We want the monies that have been cut to be reinstated. We need a strong United Nations, I think, to prevent genocides, to prevent civil wars like Syria from getting out of hand. Uh, and the principles the, the UN principles of, of human rights are like, uh, they're, they're the moral compass. They're the, the way we evaluate a society, I think. If you read the Declaration of Human Rights, I don't know if Umar has some copies, I think he said he was going to make some. Do you have those copies, Umar, of the Declaration of Human Rights? Pardon? Yes, I do have yes. Alright, so he's going to be at some point giving out, this is the declaration, it's a little booklet, about 30 articles, and Monta is going to be talking a little more about those. But if you read them, it gives, it, it, it gives you a guide about what's right and wrong. And if you see women and children being gassed at our borders, the Declaration of Human Rights would tell you this is not right, there's something wrong here. So the UN and these uh, human rights, just like our Bill of Rights, are standards and guides to guide our behavior. Um, all right, I wanted to say I'd also like to see the uh, Security Council change so that one country cannot veto 192 countries. So someday I hope to lobby against or with our legislators to convince them to make the UN stronger so it really works and does create, they do a lot of wonderful things. I mean the United Nations has so many good humanitarian groups, including refugee groups, but they can do a lot more if people believed in them and uh, that's why we're asking you to join the UNA. Uh, you know, the uh, the UNA Association, and the UNA Association, um, I'll read a little bit about it. Um, the members help the UN raising awareness on top global issues, fundraising for UN causes, advocating for strong US support for the UN. Throughout the year, the UNA-USA chapters hold hundreds of events. Um, across the country to connect American communities to the mission and work of the UN and support local efforts to address global challenges such as fighting human trafficking, advancing the sustainable development goals. The UNA-USA chapters hold fundraisers to build classrooms in refugee camps through the Adopt a Future campaign. The UNA-USA partners with the State Department to provide free model UN instruction tools to K through 12. So we hope eventually to see UN uh, model UN programs in every high school and every college in this area because we want to teach young people about what the UN does and can do. Um, so, um, and I, I want to thank those people again who helped set things up. Uh, my wife did a lot of work getting the flyer out getting um, the event out on Eventbrite. Joel Moses has helped. Um, Charles Robodeau has helped. Uh, Andrew Mali has helped. So many people helped put this together. Um, let's see what else I wanted to say. Oh, I'm going to call on you in a minute, Umar. Um, okay. I 
think I'll just say one more thing before I invite Umar to say a few words before we get started. Um, you know, we we need these we need people that uh, can that believe in these uh, human rights. I mean, why do we follow people? Why do we admire people? Who are the people we admire and follow? And uh, <laughs> That's all they gave us. But we admire people like Martin Luther King. Jesus had a moral compass. A lot of people still, still follow his values and principles. Abraham Lincoln. Uh, um, Vedo O'Rourke perhaps has, has, a, has a moral princi principle. Bernie Sott does... I think has some moral principles. Um, so these are some of the people that I admire, and I think and Gary, and that's why Gary's here today. We, we need to listen, uh, and William Barber, I forgot to talk about William Barber. Now there's a man who you know, has recently spoken out uh, against systemic racism, militarism, uh, ecological devastation, the need for education, housing, uh, health care. Uh, are not these human rights to have a decent house, to have a job, to have health care? So I think we need to listen to William Barber, and you can look him up. If you're not familiar with the People's Campaign, uh, you should be, because I think it's an important program. Okay, I think I've said too much, and uh, Uma is going to say a few words, and then we'll hop off with our speakers. Thank you, Marty. First of all, let me apologize. Uh, I'm a little late, uh, but uh, my name is Omar Kenyatta, and I want to greet you in the greenness of peace. You know, that's what we are about as it relates to the process of the United Nations Association. Uh, if you allow me just to take a few minutes before we actually get into the content of our program. Now, this initiative started about five years ago with my involvement in the city of Richmond in terms of carrying young people to the State Department to participate in the Model UN program. But with that being said, we got an opportunity to meet with other persons, Charles, I mean um, Marty and Charles, and we begin to say, well, why don't we put our efforts together and establish a United Nations Association? But I want to, you know, this has been a very peculiar week. How many of you think it's been a very peculiar week in terms of the public affairs and social issues that uh, we've been confronted confront with as Americans. Now, what, what, what's my flag? Oh, please, no, please, you knocked it over. Oh, please don't let the flag jump on the floor. Now, one of the things that when we talk about the mission and work of the United Nations in terms of particular this particular time of the year in which we uh, celebrate the seventh year of the Declaration of human rights, or should I say the universal declaration of human rights. Now we all know this is not a perfect world, perfect nation states, no one is actually here in reality to what the declaration says. But it's hope. And I want to really congratulate you in terms of getting up on your Saturday morning and being present because you are a representation of that hope. And I'm glad to see these young people here in terms of our generation given and developing the blueprint that one day that this hope as it relates to the Universal Declaration will be realized in their time and they will pass it on to generations and generations. But I want to connect something to this whole expression of hope that the Declarations uh, encourage us to think about, reflect about, and hopefully be a transformative in government to allow the individual to have these particular rights. As Thomas Jefferson said, there are two brothers 
and the beginning of a human life. The breath of life and the breath of liberty. I'm going to talk about that just a little point in regards to why the flag is here. One of the realities that we as Americans have is our birthright is the spirit of liberty and freedom. And we know, we ain't going to discuss the contradictions that exist in terms of building the democracy, because we know it's not been a perfect democracy. But one of the things that I do say and I do believe in, our documents as it relates to all men created equal, endowed by that creative and certain other rights, we got to pass that on to, to a generation now can, who can universalize that in the context of nation-state relationships with the work of the United Nations or other world body groups who can address the issues of mankind. <coughs> so again, I applaud your presence here today. As Charles has indicated, the vision of our efforts is to make Richmond, Virginia the epic center of global engagement global engagement with our universal values that are established in our Constitution, our Bill of Rights, and the founding fathers and ladies. Each generation got founding fathers and ladies and to what extent that the American idea is realized. And so now we is our watch in terms of what we do with the principles. The founding fathers obviously thought that the American idea would be a proposition of a transformed man to, who can embrace personal sovereignty, the rule of law. Now it's our generation to perpetuate that, to see that it still exists, it's sustaining. But more importantly, you are here to hear in discussions from our panel members and others who individuals don't live in our lives, don't live in our communities. But we are concerned about the dislocation of humanity all through the world. All throughout the world, we are finding refugees, refugee camps, and the kind of conditions that are confronted with those persons. Immigration issues, in terms of immigration laws, what's fair, what's just, right in our backyard in regards to the southern hemisphere, in terms of uh, 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 the Caribbean, uh, South America. What are going on in the nation's states that people are actually uh, risking their lives, leaving their children? This is a human situation. And you're here to give reality to that. So we are hoping that we don't just go and listen to our, uh, our speakers, our scholars, in terms of what is actually going on. But this is a point of action. And our role, in terms of the United Nations Association, is to create that vehicle, to create uh, that path to what goes on in the city of Richmond, what goes on in Virginia. As Virginia is known for the uh, state of precedence, and America begins here in terms of its concepts and ideas, so it be that the global dimension of engagement begins here in Richmond. It begins here in Virginia. And we want to make sure that if you come <coughs> in our environment, there will be a flag. There will be the American flag. There will be the United Nations flag. Because we stand on the principles of the founding fathers, but we are universalizing it. <coughs> and we can say as Americans that God, in God we trust. We don't have to push that. We, we demonstrate that by our deeds of engagement. And that's what we're about today. Deeds of engagement. Deeds of engagement as it relates to civic engagement in our city, but also today, global engagement. So we really, again, we applaud you in terms of you taking time uh, to be a part of us. Uh, the young people, we really want you to step in some leadership. We got leadership posts ready. So we want you to step in with your ideas, your creativity, your innovativeness. We need you in the city of Richmond, to galvanize, to, to get, get excited about your watch on keeping these principles alive uh, in our culture and in our society. With that being said, I want to thank all the panels in terms of your uh, uh, taking time.
to be a part of this and to uh, give us your perspectives as we move this process along. With that being said, Thank you. my big brother is here. Oh, one, more, one more thing. How many of you, this is the first time in Virginia Union? Have you, have you raised your hand? First time in Virginia Union. Just a quick, quick point of Virginia Union. You are in an expression of America's greatness. America's greatness. This university was started 1865, one year after the Civil War. It was started with initiative, freemen, ex-slaves, and abolitionists. So you see, this university carries the American spirit, a rebirth <coughs> and renewal. And we hope this will be your last time here. Uh, and, and please, uh, during the break time, uh, please take time to review uh, uh, the, uh, the uh, larger part of the library. You've got images in there in terms of giving you a, a little history in terms of this university. But you're walking on sacred ground. This is sacred ground. A lot of tears. I don't know what's funny. Because a lot of tears and a lot of prayers have made this possible in a way you can even imagine. Way you can imagine. We're talking about people who walk North Carolina, South Carolina, walked to get to this university for education. Now we got to keep it. You know? Yeah. So I would want you to know you're on sacred ground. If you know, this, this divide got to stop. We got to pass on some principles to this younger generation in terms of this principle called America and what its strength and capacity is. Always about renewal. That being said, I better give you a chart. Thank you. Thank you again for your. Okay, advice. so we're gonna. Thank you, Uma, for some inspiring thoughts. Um, so Monty Dad is gonna talk a little bit about the this little booklet here. Some of the thirty articles in here. Slavery, I think, is mentioned. Voting, a few other things. Uh, so he's got about ten minutes. Then each panelist will have about fifteen minutes. And then we'll have some, dis and uh, I'm going to ask Gary to say a few words, and we're going to have a discussion uh, and questions, comments for about 20 minutes. So that's the program. Monti University of Richmond, nine years, has been helping us get started. You're on. Here you go. Come up and I guess speak from here would be good. Uh, good morning, all. Um, my name is Monty Dada. I'm a, an associate professor of political science at the University of Richmond. I was born and raised in Los Angeles, California. Anybody ever been out to Cali? Don't want to go back out there. <laughs> LA. Um, my my worldview was formed in Los Angeles. One of my favorite memories was on uh, Friday afternoons. I would go to the local comic book shop in Hollywood, and it was this intersection that was sort of, um, LA is sort of like a medley, it's like a pizza with all these different ethnic groups, and they converged in this one spot in, in Los Angeles and Hollywood. There was the Orthodox Jewish community, the Korean community, the LGBT community, uh, the Iranian community, they're all there. And uh, that, that was my worldview. But when I, when I moved to, to Virginia, I, I really, I guess in a way kind of woke up, you know, I, I, I never thought living in Richmond, Virginia would be, I mean, in, in some ways, maybe more of an education than getting my PhD and really looking at the roots of the American experience and, and the Commonwealth of Virginia. And I, and I still puzzle over that phrase, Commonwealth. I, 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 don't, I don't know what that, I mean, I like, I like the idea. Um, and, and, and these days, as I, as I grow and, and learn just more as a, as a human being and, and as a researcher, uh, a lot of my work now looks at, at uh, modern slavery, at the roots and, and origins of how it's why people are bought and sold today. And, and the most conservative estimates say there are maybe 40 million human beings who are, who are around the world bought and sold. And if you look in the Times-Dispatch, from time to time you'll see cases of, of underage youth 
uh, who were bought and sold for sex. And so what breaks my heart is, in, in this city where a lot of the Civil War was fought, we still don't have freedom in a very real sense for all human beings. Um, I think the American experience is, is still growing, still evolving. And, and I guess today we're, we're going to touch a little bit on the theme of refugees. Uh, I am myself not a scholar of refugees, but I am very passionate about international institutions like the UN. And uh, Marty asked me today to speak a little bit about the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. Uh, on Monday, on December 10th, uh, that will be Human Rights Day. And we are in the year 2018, and so it will have been 70 years since the United Nations uh, General Assembly adopted this, this idea of universal human rights. And, and I think anybody coming from a position of faith would agree inherently that, that there are these universal rights of, of what we're entitled to, of protection under the law, uh, civil liberties. And um, I, I pulled up a copy of the preamble of the Universal Declaration, and I just want to read to you um, one of my favorite bits that I think captures the, the spirit of the Declaration. And... Here it is. It looks like I pulled up a, uh, a kid's copy, so it's got all these images. And, um, here we go. Um, here's just a couple of the phrases of the preamble that, that I think characterize the spirit of the Universal Declaration. As to whether or not we really live in a world today with guaranteed human rights, I think that's a separate thing. But in the preamble back in 1948, this is what they wrote. Whereas disregard and contempt for human rights have resulted in barbarous acts which have outraged the conscience of mankind and the advent of a world in which human beings shall enjoy freedom of speech and belief and freedom from fear and want has been proclaimed as the highest aspiration of the common people. Uh, whereas it is essential, if man is not to be compelled to have recourse as a last resort to rebellion against tyranny and oppression, that human rights should be protected by the rule of law. And, and it continues. But th there's this one phrase that I think captures the element of, of how the, the framers of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights saw the entire document, and it's the idea of constructing a society where there's freedom from fear and freedom from want. Right? So freedom from want, you know, the right to have food, the right to have education, the right to have health care, the right to have nutrition, and freedom from fear, you know, the right, the right to be protected, the right to not be marginalized, the right not to be vulnerable. Um, the other thing I wanted to share with you is that last night I was thinking more about refugees, and there are all sorts of estimates out there. I just quoted you uh, a figure of some 40 million people who are um, estimated to be enslaved today. But uh, as, of, as of today, UNICEF estimates maybe upwards of, of 60 million persons who are of some fashion refugees, whether they're internally displaced or externally displaced. And so if we're looking at, a, at this reality where millions and millions and millions of people don't have their human rights guaranteed, I, I think we could say um, we're pretty darn far off from this realization of human rights. And yet, as, as Marty mentioned at the beginning of his words, here in the city of Richmond, you know, it, it would be a good thing if we could do more to establish a UN association where, at the very least, <coughs> we're, we're talking about the ideas. And I believe um, at a previous meeting, uh, there was a lovely discussion of not just thinking about human rights in terms of, you know, these, these international human rights. I know most of the world today is worried. When we think about human rights, we think about things like Syria or Burma or, or Afghanistan. But in reality, I, I think one can make the argument very tragically that Richmond, Virginia suffers profoundly from human rights violations, going all the way back to the end of the Civil War and this, this imaginary emancipation where people of African-American descendants were, were told they were free. But I think you could very much make the case today that people of, of my skin color uh, are, are not free in America, especially if you look at mass incarceration, for instance. Um, so. If we grow this idea of a UN association, 
I really think the goal can be looking at human rights locally. You know, the right to, to health care, the right to clean drinking water, the right to an education. These are things that in Richmond, a lot of the people um, in our city suffer from immensely. Um, so, I mean, I, I don't know what's going to come out of this experiment, but, but I think that's the wish, that's the intention of why we're here today. And as Monday rolls around, and as we come upon the 70th, 70th anniversary of the Declaration, you know, I think at the very least we have a good conversation topic for the week with our friends, with our family, with our loved ones on, you know, if we can't agree upon universal human rights, to what extent do we actually have them today in, in America? Uh, I'm excited. Uh, I'm going to learn a lot today. I'm not an expert in refugees, but we have several panelists who are. And um, I want to thank you for being here. And for now, I'm going to turn things back over to Marty, who's going to introduce uh, the rest of the panelists, after which I'll provide some reflections as a co-moderator. And then I guess we'll jump into Q&A uh, and, and see where the conversation takes us uh, for the morning. All right, thanks, y'all. Thank you very much. Um, well, our first uh, panelist is uh, Sayum Baer. Sayum is the Virginia State Refugee Coordinator. Before joining the state, he was director of the Catholic <coughs> Charities Migration and Refugee Services from 2001 to 2015. Prior to that, Mr. Baer was, has worked with the Ethiopian, Ethiopian Community Development Council and the American University in Washington, D.C. as Director of Research and Records in the Office of Development. Mr. Baer holds a B.A. in History and an M.S. in Education Administration from Niagara University. Welcome, Mr. Baer. Good morning and thank you. Uh, I usually do not do well behind anything. I usually am in there, but I think I have to check this, so I'm going to stand here. Uh, and when you said Niagara University, I do want to tell you it's a little bit cold there, uh, but I love it. And I love it at that time. And uh, you know, I was always impressed with our founding fathers until I got messed up after reading Frederick Douglass uh, oh, yeah. <laughs> speech in, Richmond, uh, in uh, Rochester. That kind of messed me up, I'm going to tell you. But I, you know, I still have, of course, a respectful opinion, but obviously uh, I was looking at him and yeah, I'm having a problem here. But <laughs> uh, the one thing that was said here, America is always about renewal. I, I do want to keep that in mind as we're going through the refugee program and the data and whatever is going on. We're not done yet. We're never done. So I want to make sure that we have the hope, we have the creativity, we have the ability to change, and we do that a lot. So that's the hope I want to make sure is here before I depress you. <laughs> and I want to make sure I don't uh, I stay with the time that has been allotted to me. So let me <coughs> make sure I got that right. Okay. Now, what do I do with this? Let's see. Any experts to move this up? Oh, yeah. It's a mouse. Oh, this one might do. No. Any expert here? Oh. Anybody? I think if you just um, use the, the space return key or something. The forward key. Or the arrow key. I usually got to look at the screen. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> wonderful. Okay. I, I just want you to look at this uh, for a second. And when I said we are about renewal, I want you to reflect what used to happen. Uh, so look at this, uh, the first one, 1792 years of residency. Will that mic any... reach? Huh? The mic. Oh, I thought I had a very big mouth. I no. Okay, let me do this. Okay, you can hear me now, yes. right? That's the commercial. 
Okay, now 1790, as you can see, two years of residency for any free white person to be a citizen. We started with that. Uh, and then we, I, I'm not going to go through everything, but you know what, uh, 1882, uh, there was a lot. At one point, they thought the Chinese were not smart enough to be citizens. And then we hear they're too smart. <laughs> What's wrong with us? Okay. And then uh, 1922, I don't have to explain this. <clears throat> and then, of course, 1948, uh, technical provision is discriminating against Catholics and Jews. Uh, it kind of touches me as a Catholic and a Semitic person, so hey, I got a problem with that. Now, <coughs> One fundamental question we must ask, keep asking ourselves is this. Is the United States as a nation of immigrants? Or is it a nation that is kind to welcome immigrants? It's an identity issue. However you define the United States on this is going to impact our thinking as where well we're going. You see, if we believe we are an immigrant nation, you cannot fight with your own identity. But you, if you believe we're just a nice, kind nation welcoming refugees, we can deal with that any day. That's the difference. And, and I'm never allowed to say anything political, so forgive me if I stay really away from it. Sometimes I make mistakes. But, but honestly, when you look at, at this definition, I think you'll make your mind where we're going. And is it good for America or not? Let's not just think to be kind and nice to other people and to welcome people, but let's also think what is good for America. What is the identity of America? This is not just a good deed. It is fundamental of who we are. And it might be in our best interest to keep our identity as it has always been. But if we change that, then we will be impacted by that decision because the identity crisis is a dangerous thing. And that's the identity that I have understood, that what I have read as a history student and when that changes, I get nervous because then there is schizophrenia going on and who we are, what we are about. You see, the origins of refugees have changed, have moved around the world. Uh, 1790 to 1950, mostly European. And by the way, we always had a challenge with arrivals of refugees. It's a fact that Jewish people running from the most inhuman environment would not even be accepted easily. Even that. So we should not be shocked today when we hear certain ethnic groups, certain religions cannot come here. Well, you know what? This is not the first time we're doing this. It's not. This was probably the worst ever. And we did it. But you know, again, as I said in the beginning, we are about renewal. We can change. We do change. We find our mistakes and we have a corrective ability. That's the hope. We have done it. We have done mistakes. But we hope, always have recovered. And that's my hope for the American identity to keep going back to, to itself. And then Asia. Southeast Asia. Well, <clears throat> again, it was our own uh, uh, dilemma that we had to deal with. But isn't it the same in Iraq and Afghanistan? Isn't it our own dilemma that we have to deal with? What's the difference between Vietnam, Iraq, and, and Afghanistan? And even Syria? Well, let me not push the envelope here. Uh, and then <laughs> Africa, completely different. <coughs> I do believe, and this is not purely politics, I do believe as a superpower, as a nation that has so much 
resources and power, so do we have responsibility that goes with that power. That's where we have to be careful. As your capacity increases, your responsibility increases. We can scale. We're not some small country that doesn't have anything. We're not. By grace or by curse, we are a superpower. And superpowers ought to behave in a certain way. Are we? Well, that you have to answer. I will never answer that question. <laughs> and Central America is, is again another issue that I will absolutely not dodge because into it. Uh, there are other people who will speak about it, but I also have limitations on the subject matter that I can talk about, by the way. Again, this is uh, just a map pointing where the refugees were coming. We don't have to spend time on it. Uh, again, uh, the arrivals from Asian uh, countries, uh, Middle East, Africa. Now, numbers. What I want you to pay attention to is not necessarily how many people arrived each year, but the plan. In 2016-17, we were talking about 80% refugees allowed to come here. 2019, federal fiscal year starting October, 2018 starting October, this October, the presidential determination that is what allows, approves arrival of refugees have approved 30,000 from 80. That doesn't mean 30,000 will arrive. That's the maximum number. That's a tough one. And that's why right now, in Richmond, from our hometown, there were three resettlement agencies that are providing services. We will have only two, because there are no num enough numbers uh, to sustain that program the State Department and the voluntary agencies with consultation with my office will make the final determination with which of the three agencies will be closed. And I hope this is not the first time you're hearing this, is it? I'm sorry. <laughs> Harris is not involved in the three. She's, she's outside of that. She does a lot of work. I know her and her agency. But the three agencies that have contract with the State Department through their national agency one of them will be eliminated by December 14th. I told you not to be depressed early. I knew I was going to do this, but I did tell you we are about renewal. We're going to be okay. Uh, now, I want to touch on fiction and facts. I have like around 10 of them, but I, I, we don't have time to go over it, but I want to mention a few of them. No one is checking refugees who come to the United States. They can just fly from Baghdad and end up in New York, right? They can just fly in any time, any day. Well, refugees are the most vetted group among newcomers, and I'm going to show you one thing that will help. I think it takes time, maybe. Yep, okay. There are around 12 separate federal entities that check refugees. Each one of them have hand in vetting the refugees. Wow. Wow. Around 12 federal agencies. So when you hear like all the the refugee, the terrorist is coming in. Give me a break. <laughs> That's all I can say. I don't know how best, best to explain that. That is so not true. Uh, and of course, fiction, refugees are exhausting our public benefits. The truth is, yes, refugees do get benefits when they arrive here for a very short period. I had our research person do analysis Comparing what they are given and what they give back, we're talking about billions of dollars that are produced by refugees. And I didn't want to give that statistic because it's not official yet. But I have gone through it and it's impressive. Yes, we do. 
when they arrive here, imagine if you got up tomorrow morning and went to Japan forever. You just decided to go. I want you to think how you would survive in Tokyo. And I'm assuming you don't speak Japanese, right? Anybody? Okay, you're all in trouble. You go to Japan, you don't know the language, you don't know the culture, try to survive. And you have no, the money. You have no money. Understand? The dollar works everywhere. But in this case, I want to imagine you don't have dollar in your hand. That's what's happening. So if we help them a little bit during the first few months, they give back. We're getting, understand, doctors, engineers, scientists, that the dictator has messed up their life. We didn't spend a penny in him or her, and we get them here. Not bad. So think about the benefit for the United States having these refugees come here. And, and this is the subject I have been asked to talk about. What are the challenges of integration? And it's a road with a lot of blocks, a lot of challenges. The first one, the first one is cultural challenge. That's the biggest one. People say, is it the language, English? Yeah, but it's more than the language. It's the cultural issue that really is the most difficult thing for refugees to be integrated. They come from completely different background. The gender equity, gender relationship, it changes the minute they step into America. The generational challenges, I'll give you an example. These are from my past reading. In 15 years I have done refugee resettlement, so uh, i give you an example. <coughs> A Somali gentleman said, Mr. Siyum, you told us we cannot hit our children and our wives. I don't understand. If I don't do that, how am I going to control my family? <laughs> my response, and I literally did this, I looked at him and I said, yes, you can do that. I'm going to visit you in prison. He looked at me, you're crazy. I said, no, I'm not. I purposely did that to kind of shock and slowly explain why that is not allowed. But I always did that. They're coming with a whole different value system, different experience. And I'm not just talking about beating a wife or child. I'm talking a lot of attitudes, values, and belief system they have. And it's a whole different. So that's a tough one. And I know your agency and others around here are assisting refugees with language and cultural competency, that is the most difficult one in order to integrate with the existing American uh, community. Yes, English is, is a tough one. High expectation. I, I, I guess I didn't tell you this, but I'm sure from my accent you can understand I wasn't born here, right? Who did not understand that? Come on. <laughs> you all knew where the heck was he born. Uh, I was born in East Africa, Ethiopia. And I can tell you the first time I came to that beautiful Niagara Falls, which is freezing even in September, <laughs> I brought a very small luggage. One. Just one. Why? I said, oh, my suit, my, you know, I don't need all this. I'm going to America. There is everything. Streets are painted with gold, right? So I left all my good clothes, and when I came, there was nothing. And I'm, oh my God, what did I do? A nice guy went, took and bought me this huge Eskimo looking jacket in September in front of kids who have t-shirt and jeans. I am walking around with that thing and they're all looking at me like, what is wrong with them? Well, what was wrong with me? Eskimo coat in September, it's just not the way to do in America. But I was cold, I was freezing because I came from Sahara. So, so those are the th things that really <coughs> Don't help you integrate fast and do things that you need to do to take care of your parents. You're dealing with so many things, emotional. Oh my God, am I ever going to go back? Am I ever going to see my family? Are they going to kill them because I escaped? That's the experience, thank God, we don't have. But we must start imagining the pain they go through. The mental health issue, the trauma. They've been abused with, by some stupid dictator in their home country. They've been running around in hiding. They went through a very tough road, and they came here, and we don't have dictatorship, but we have a tough culture. 
So it's a kind of triple trauma. Back there, on the road here, and here. They have to beat all that and become self-sufficient. When they arrive at the airport, Melon Brothers Law, what, what we, we used to tell them at the airport, you know you have to work immediately. <laughs> this, is, this is the refugee resettlement world. That's the first thing we tell them, as if like, uh, what does work have to do with tonight having a peaceful sleep? Oh no, 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 we want you to know you got to work immediately. I speak no English. Well, you still have to work. That's the American way. That's how we ask them to help themselves. But the difficulty is clear. The cultural orientation is fundamental to make them start their new life in a positive way. And the best thing to do, okay, no, I have to do this, okay. And overall, while we're having a challenge in the number of refugees that are allowed to come here, what we must work towards is empowering them, helping them become self-sufficient, and become part of this community. They're not guests, as you know. They're not going anywhere. They're here now. They have to be part of the American fabric. And we have to look around and look at our neighbor, see how we can help them. Always remember, what would you do if you go to a country you have never been to, don't speak the language, don't have the money, and treat them exactly the way you would like to be treated if, God forbid, you ever have to go that way. Thank you. Thank you very much. We're all one big family, and we've got to help those that are coming here. And uh, our next speaker is Lana Keith Martinez, and she's going to talk about the sanctuary movement and diverse communities collaborating to help refugees. Lana is an itinerant preacher, educator, and community mobilizer who works with faith communities and political activists on movement building. Bringing gifts of networking, lived experience, and a theological education rooted in women's liberation theology, Lana has been involved in the sanctuary movement in Virginia. In addition to the faith-based activism, Lana coordinates legislative advocacy at the General Assembly for clients who share the same radical vision of social justice. A mother of three boys, six and under, Lana has become an expert multitasker, often preaching, teaching, and marching with a baby in her arms. Lana. Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Uh, yeah, so my name is Lana Heath Day Martinez, and um, so I wanted to just start by telling you a story today. Um, my story is this. In 2014, I got the chance to visit my husband's hometown with him. He had spent 10 years in the United States as an undocumented person, and he finally, after many years and $10,000, uh, was approved for his legal permanent residency. So we had to return to Mexico so that he could go to his consular interview. So we went to visit his mother. And in his small rural village, uh, we asked questions about, you know, is there a lot of violence here? What is the struggle like for you? And my mother-in-law told us, Oh, you know, we don't have to worry too much about the cartels because we're so poor. And anyways, they come through and tell us when they're coming. The police let us know they're coming. And so then we all just lock our doors and turn off our lights and we just stay inside, you know, for a day or two or a week. And it was no big deal to her because she wasn't going to die. 
So the gentleman who picked us up, who drove the taxi, he, um, he was 22, and he had grown up in the same small town. And in fact, my husband was friends with his big brother when they were growing up. And so we were asking him some questions about his experience. And he had gone to the university in this big city of Veracruz, and he was studying to be a veterinarian. One night he went out with a friend, and they were walking along the streets, and they saw a decapitated head under a park bench in the middle of the city of Veracruz. So there was a period of time, I think it was in 2008, uh, where the cartels beheaded like 80 people in one night in Veracruz. And at that time, the Marines came in, the Mexican Marines came in, and took over um, control of the state government. So our friend, the taxi driver, he decided that he was not going to stay in the city of Veracruz. He didn't want to go back home to poverty, so he came to the United States seeking to survive. Um, he was later deported and then became a taxi driver upon his return to Mexico. I would like to read you a poem by Warson Shire called home. No one leaves home unless home is the mouth of a shark. You only run for the border when you see the whole city running as well. Your neighbors running faster than you, the boy you went to school with who kissed you dizzy behind the old tin factory is holding a gun bigger than his body. You only leave home when home won't let you stay. No one would leave home unless home chased you, fire under your feet, hot blood in your belly. That's not something you ever thought about doing, and so when you did, you carried the anthem under your breath, waiting until the airport toilet tear, to tear up the passport and swallow each mouthful of paper, making it clear that you would not be going back. You have to understand, no one puts their children in a boat unless the water is safer than the land. Who would choose to spend days and nights in the stomach of a truck unless the miles traveled meant something more than journey? No one would choose to crawl under fences, be beaten until your shadow leaves you, raped and then drowned and forced to the bottom of the boat because you are darker be sold, starved, shot at the border like a sick animal, be pitied, lose your name, lose your family, make a refugee camp, a home for a year or two or ten, stripped and searched, find prison everywhere, and if you survive and you're greeted on the other side, with go-home blacks, refugees, dirty immigrants, asylum seekers, sucking our country dry of milk, Dark with their hands out, smell strange, savage. Look what they've done to their own countries. What will they do to ours? The dirty looks in the streets, softer than a limb torn off. The indignity of everyday life, more tender than 14 men who look like your father between your legs. Insults easier to swallow than rubble, than your child's body in pieces. For now, forget about pride. Your survival is more important. I want to go home, but home is the mouth of a shark. Home is the barrel of the gun. And no one would leave home unless home chased you to the shore, unless home tells you to leave what you could not behind, even if it was human. No one leaves home until home is a damp voice in your ear saying, leave, run now. I don't know what I've become. Mm. Home. I have another story to invite you into, but first I would like to give a warning. If you have lived through war, the story is a bit graphic. Um, and so if you need to get up uh, or just take a break in some way, please feel free to do that. If you could just like relax 
close your eyes if you want to. I want to invite you in to something that's been happening that many of our neighbors who live right here survived. 30 years ago, she was in the playground and she watched as her cousins were buried alive. 29 years ago, she watched as her best friend was shot in the head. 25 years ago, her family ran to a new city to survive. 23 years ago, her siblings were killed. A few years ago, it was five years ago, her home was burned down with her whole family inside. Four years ago, her husband ran to the United States trying to survive. Three years ago, she followed him and on her way, she was raped, she was assaulted, she was extorted, and she arrived without her dignity, without her mental health, and with over $20,000 in extortionist debt to a country that put her in detention and accused the victim of being the criminal was strapped an electric monitor around her ankle and showed her on the screen how they would track every step she took. Two years ago, she watched her children graduate across the screen, two of them at the same time, and she wept for all that is missing. Her home that she left behind was above all things human. Her home was also the mouth of a shark. Today, this is a woman who lives in sanctuary. She was welcomed in to a local faith community, actually not, not local to us, but local to her. And they came alongside her with such great faith and compassion. She's living inside of a church now for over a year. She was going to be deported. They didn't care about all the danger that she faced, so she moved into the church. The community has lifted her up and declared that she is a person worthy of dignity and respect a person who deserves her liberation and her self-determination. So she told me, uh, one of the first times that we met actually, I said, how's your experience here? What are you feeling? What do you need? And she said, I have been running from people since I was seven years old. I will run no more. I am here, I am going to be free, and I have never felt safe in 41 years, like I do now. So what's happening around this particular woman is a movement is being built. She has over 400 people supporting her regularly who know her story who are there to hear from her, and who can hear from her the ways that she needs to be supported. I think this is one of the key things that I want to share with you today, is the just essential nature of listening to the communities that we've been talking about, whether it's refugees who have that official status, or refugees who are denied that official status, or have faced the same circumstances, a story I told you that happened in Guatemala, not in Syria. Um, the folks who have lived these things know best how they need to be helped and supported. And so we need to ask them, and then listen, and hear their stories, and meet them where they are. 
as they have a different understanding like from their culture or from their experience, then we have to hear that, acknowledge it, and then see what the way forward is together. Because the only way that we can really change what's happening today is by building a movement. And the movement has to include us all. I think about it like, okay, we're all on the same train, but it has lots of different cars, and nobody can miss a stop. Like, it stops everywhere for everyone. You don't get to just say, oh, well, I want, I want to skip this one, this one, this one, and get there. Nope, can't do it. So some of us are still over here. We're like maybe at the first stop where we're just learning about refugees being vetted or we're just learning about the history of US intervention in Central America. Um, and some of us maybe actually have been part of these communities for a long time and have those relationships and a more nuanced understanding of what's happening. And we can't bring people who haven't even learned that history yet all the way over here. We have to like walk together through each step. But we need each other. Because I can't push change by myself, and you can't push change by yourself. Like We need each other. So I think we take everybody. OK. I am not working for an organization. I work with organizations, so I can be as political as I want. <laughs> so the way I see it, we need everybody, from your perspective, who's about like here to here. And we're going to take all of those people together who are headed in the same general direction and see what we can do to move, our, to move social change all together in the same direction. And the sanctuary movement, I think, is very unique in its ability to bring people from a wide political spectrum together. So you have faith communities, which are often but not always more centrist in their views. And then you have also like radical left uh, anti-fascists um, and other activists who also are in solidarity and want to support this movement. So you bring people together based on one principle, and that is human dignity and the fact that everyone deserves to be free. So I just wanted to like think a little bit about movement building with you today. It's constant education, right? Like what we're doing today, this is one kind of education. But you also have different kinds of education. The best thing to do is bring in people who have lived this experience and have them do political education with you and teach you from their own perspective. Um, you can watch documentaries and host film screenings. Uh, then you also need to have healing spaces because with every step of conscientization, um, every time that people hear the same stories or tell the same stories and are re-traumatized, there is a lot of pain, and we have to heal it to be able to move forward, and especially if we're going to move forward together. And then, you know, just like remembering that people are on the way, and in the middle of becoming more conscious about the different issues that face our communities, we're also still all human beings. Every one of us. And so we might be promoting somebody as this great leader who's rising up from the refugee community, and maybe like they're just having trouble in their marriage and they just need to take a break for a minute and they don't have the capacity to like lead something right now. Or maybe, the, on, conversely, you're wondering why this person who um, claims that they want to support you just can't get to the events that you're doing and maybe they're just sick or they have a sick child, or they just have life happening that's not allowing them to. So we have to also have some amount of grace for each other that will recognize our full humanity of all of us. Um, you know, um, one of my favorite faith leaders is Rabbi Gary Crudger. And he said to me about a year ago, he said, well, Lana, you know, when I think about the Jewish scriptures, and what that has to say about welcoming immigrants and foreigners, I think about the scripture that's where God says, be holy for I am holy. And the rabbi said, you know, God didn't say some people should be holy. God didn't say, like, just one person be holy. God said, everybody, be holy for I am holy. God didn't see a distinction between uh, one person and another or one tribe and another. Be holy as I am holy. 
Now, I went to seminary uh, just down the street, Union Presbyterian Seminary, and one of my, um, the lessons that has stuck with me since then, and I come from a Christian background, is this idea that like the codes in the Old Testament scriptures and the Hebrew Bible, the only difference between those legal codes from other cultures at the same time were two things. One was a provision to care for the vulnerable, widows and children, and the other was the requirement to welcome the stranger. Those are the only two things that set apart the Hebrews' legal code from the other, the other groups at the same time. And I think that that's what sticks with us today, like this whole idea that all of our different faith traditions call us to actually repair the things that are broken from our own lives, from our own selves, from our relationships, and then at a macro scale within our culture. Um, and then to make reparations to the people who have been hurt once we've recognized the harm that's been done, right? So I think that when we talk about like movement building, we have to bring our whole selves to the work, and that's our faith, that's our spiritual background, that's our education, that's our family, that's our own experience, uh, it's history, it's an analysis of politics that we have, and bringing all of that together, like we have so much power as people who are united in movement that we actually can really make a change and a difference. So that's what I want to leave you with today. I will say that my friends at the end of the table stole most of my thunder because I wanted to go through immigration laws, but I won't bore you with that again. And then Seema will be talking about the caravan. Um, so uh, I can't wait for you to hear from her firsthand experience. But I just want to leave you with this today. Like we, the work that we have to do, whether it's building a new association for the UN or whether it's like supporting our refugee neighbors, it's all about building movement and being united for social change. Doing the constant work for ourselves, with each other, and together for our society. And just like recognizing human dignity above all else and being willing to listen to those who are different. So that's what I have for you today. Thank you for having me. Gave us a lot to think about, and our our last speaker uh, is Kate Ayers. She is <coughs> an executive director at Reestablished Richmond. Um, Kate joined Reestablished Richmond in 2013, motivated by her participation in the Just Faith program class focusing on social justice issues around the world. She previously worked as a special education teacher and department chair in Hanover County for 11 years, while also serving as a volunteer mentor for refugees in the Richmond community. Kate dedicated her effort, dedicated efforts continue to build a supportive, trustworthy community for refugees living in Richmond and She's going to talk about uh, helping refugees in the Richmond area. Thank you. Thank you for having me here today. I'm grateful for um, the presenters before me because I feel like that they really kind of set a nice um, <clears throat> basis for what I want to talk to you about today. I'm going to be talking to you today about rebuilding networks. And if you will, for a second, just think about who is in your network. How did you build your network? Have you ever moved to a new city where you had to start all over? So I'll give you a second to think about that. But I'd, also, I'd, I'd like to ask you, how many of you got your first job or any job because you knew someone already? How many of you learned to drive because you had a family member or a relative that was brave enough to teach you how to drive? How many of you have ever been hospitalized or had an illness and you had people visit you in the hospital? How many of you have ever tried to buy a new home 
and you you found a real estate agent that you could trust through a friend or a recommendation. So networks are integral to who we are. And as I get to visit many refugee homes, the one thing that I hear in every home that I visit, no matter where they are from, is this phrase. We have to start from zero. So whether you came here with refugee status or you're coming here without any kind of documentation, all new immigrants must start from zero and have to rebuild their, their lives. Refugees from Bhutan and Congo, zero means having to be resettled in a highly industrialized society for the first time. If you're a refugee from Afghanistan who had a very high ranking position and were an, was an interpreter for the US military, starting from zero means that you are now beginning at an entry level job. If you are an Afghan female and you grew up during the Taliban regime, starting from zero means that you get to the, the right to read and write for the first time in your life. If you are a refugee from Burma who was persecuted because of your faith and your ethnicity, starting from zero means for the first time you can worship freely in your new communities. So I, I just want to challenge us here you know, to think about our networks and to think about what newcomers must rebuild. Reestablish Richmond, we're a local nonprofit, and um, one of the biggest things that we do is we empower refugees to help rebuild their networks and become more self-sufficient. And through our work, we have found over and over and over again that when refugees and immigrants have the resources they need to rebuild their networks, really amazing things happen. And I don't need to tell you all that um, all the rich diversity and the benefits that immigrants bring to our communities. But I'd like to just say that <clears throat> the networks are kind of the key to what we can do to help um, support our newest neighbors. And I want to take a little bit of time to share some local stories with you to tell you about refugees and immigrants that live here in Richmond that have been able to rebuild their networks and do some pretty astounding things. So this is Jamila. Jamila's given us permission to share her story. She is from Afghanistan. She grew up during the Taliban regime. Her husband worked in the UN, the US Embassy in Afghanistan. And because of that work that he did, he was able to come to the United States with something called a special immigrant visa, which is a kind of immigration status similar to the refugee status, except for you have to prove that you assisted the US military in their efforts. Both you can get an SIV out of Afghanistan or Iraq. So that is Jamila. Jamila came to the United States to Richmond about four years ago with her husband and two children. She was resettled by one of the local resettlement agencies that Sayum helps to provide um, support for. And that agency helped the family get a job, find a safe house. Things were going really well in terms of you know, stability for the first time in, in a long time for the family. And then, this is not a typical refugee story, but um, Jamila's husband passed away overnight because of a heart attack. So we now have a woman from Afghanistan who received no formal education or job training, a single mother overnight. And she'd already been here for about six to eight months, so some of that initial government support um, had finished. So Reestablish Richmond found out about Jamila's situation and we went to go visit. And we started helping connect Jamila to the things that she needed. Um, through our transportation program, we were able to find someone within her community to help teach her in her native language so she could learn the, the rules of the road. We reached out into our networks and found a local employer who um, does embroidery and he was wanting to bring on someone um, to help make belts for his new company. We reached out to the Islamic Center who paid her rent for the few months that it took to get her back on her feet. 
We were able to connect her to a community mentor to help her learn language and navigate school for her children. Jamila now works at the company that she started. That company now employs four or five other Afghan women. Recently, I um, was over at Deep Run Park just running and I saw under the picnic pavilion a group of people that looked kind of familiar and so I, I walked over and there was a, a large gathering from the Afghan community and there was Jamila. And Jamila had driven herself there. She had brought food for the, for the um, party that was happening. She had invited her brother and was connecting her brother to help her brother to rebuild a new network. And so it's, you know, whenever I see it, it's, it's such a beautiful story, right? I get to literally see everything kind of come full circle. Um, but that is the power of rebuilding networks. And you heard there were so many people that had a hand in helping part of that. People from faith communities, random, you know, neighbors, her employer who helped um, not only um, give her a job, but also helped her teach her how to drive. Um, so many people. The second story I want to share with you is Gret's story. And Gret definitely is proud to tell her story because she is quickly becoming the face of one of um, Richmond's small but fastest growing small businesses. And I'll tell you how that came to be in just a moment. But this is Gret. Gret uh, arrived in Richmond two or three years ago. Um, she was resettled by one of the local resettlement agencies. She's from the Congo. Um, she was born there and then was forced to, uh, violently forced to leave her home at age 12. She went into Rwanda into a refugee camp and lived there for 15 or 20 years where she had five children. So when he, she came to Richmond, she was a single mother of five. She um, res was resettled in a community she got a job very quickly, so therefore, with the support of um, the, the re local resettlement agency and social services, she was able to work, pay her rent, and make make you know pay most of her bills. Um, and about probably six to eight months into her resettlement, we met Garrett and connected her to um, a community mentor. Um, Garrett, as a single mom, was having a difficult time just navigating school for her children and paperwork and budgeting. And so this um, mentor went into her life and um, walked alongside her and tried to, you know, kind of show her ways that she could budget her money and um, better prepare for her, her children's future. And about six months into that relationship, the mentor reached out to me and she said, Kate, Garrett's TANF, which is the social services support, is going to end. You know, that's it's only you can only receive that kind of support for a certain period of time. And I'm really worried. Garrett's working night shift. She has five children. How is she going to pay the rent? She said, we've got to find a solution so that Garrett and other people in, like her in her community can make ends meet um, on their own. And so she said, you know, I have a lot of contacts, and so I'm going to start a business, and I'm going to start, um, a, start a business that makes bracelets. So this mentor talked to Garrett. Garrett was on board, wanting to be a part of this business venture. They sourced um, beads from a place in Africa and started making and selling bracelets. Um, this company is called Camille. And Camille, this within a year, we sat down with the mentor and was helping her figure out ways to help build her business and really help empower the refugees that are part of the business. And within a year, I see Camille all over Facebook. They're at all the holiday markets. They're at the VMFA Congo Mass Exhibit. They are have been featured in several magazine articles. Um, and now, because of the income, the extra income, she's still working her night shift at the factory, but because of the extra income, Garrett can not only pay her rent, but she can start planning for the future, which is, which is of course, um, even, the, even better news, right? <coughs> the final story I want to share with you is um, a story from the Bhutanese community. And the Bhutanese community has been in Richmond for five to seven years. And this group of refugees are ethnically Nepali. 
and because of a situation, in, but they were living, living in Bataan, and because of a political situation, they were forced to leave, ethnic cleansing, um, forced to leave Bhutan, were kicked out and into Nepal, where they lived for some, some, for some cases a lifetime in a refugee camp. So the Bhutanese um, came about five to seven years ago, and you can imagine <coughs> spending a lifetime in a refugee camp, um, the barriers that exist. Um, they came with a lot of trauma, a lot of mental and, and physical um, health issues. And we found that this community has really struggled to access meaningful support systems because of all the language and culture and transportation barriers. And um, about a year ago, we were able to have um, someone from the Bhutanese community as a social work intern with us. And so he had some good understanding of some of the needs and he helped he helped work with some of our staff members to develop a wellness program that would address mental and physical health um, barriers that this community would are, are facing. But it was really difficult to get word out because of communication and get people to show up to things until we met a young woman from the Bhutanese community and she learned about our program. She was struggling herself and she learned about this program and she really got it. And so she started inviting other people from her community to come and participate in our wellness program. She would go knock on doors every week. She would make sure that everybody showed up. And this program for about 12 weeks this group of 10 Bhutanese refugees gathered together. They talked about uh, mental health, they talked about stress, they did yoga. We got yoga, uh, a trauma-informed yoga instructor to come do yoga with them weekly. Um, they went out to Shalom Farms and harvested um, food on a monthly basis. And, and because of this Bhutanese young woman insistence that people from our community show up, this group of 10 individuals are now a cohesive community. They talk, they do yoga together, and they volunteer together. And just think about the power when communities are able to come together and do what they need to do. So I just want to, you know, these, I think, you know, um, Sayum and you all talked a lot about hope, and we have to hope, we have to move, we have to do things. And it really is, it doesn't, building people's networks doesn't have to cost money. It just has to, you have to be open. You have to be ready to listen. You have to um, be ready to welcome people and, and see them as a part of your community. And, and um, big things can happen, for sure. Thank you so much for having me today. Thank you very much. Um, we've got about a half hour until <coughs> lunch, so we're gonna. I want to ask Gary to say just a few words, if he would, um, and then we're gonna have questions. Montile field some questions, comments, and then we're gonna have lunch. I hope you can all stay for lunch because shortly after we start lunch, Seema is gonna tell us about her trip to Mexico and. I'm really interested to hear that. Thank you so much for your remarks. Everyone was inspiring and interesting. Some sad, but room for renewal, so that was good too. Gary, you want to say a few words? Happy Saturday, everyone. Yeah. Every day that we are alive, we should be grateful. Can we say a collective amen to that? Amen. Yeah. amen. Glad to be here. Thank you, Marty, and thank you, Omar, for the work that you're doing to liberate Richmond from its locale and myopia. Uh, we are uh, a, a big, broad world, and we need to think in those terms. So thank you for inviting me just to say a few words. Thank you for the speakers. Let's have a, a, another round of applause for all of the presentations this morning. And I want to just give you a couple of remarks on our founding fathers, the Universal Declaration, and our challenge. Our founding fathers, the Universal Declaration, and 
our challenge. Unlike Omar, I am not going to wave the flag uh, because, and I'm going to put it upside down. <laughs> Why? Because the Founding Fathers had a perverted view of what America was to be. Our Founding Fathers thought that only rich, white males were worthy of being citizens. And those rich, white males were planters and farmers. They didn't view women as equals. They viewed them as property pursuant to British law. They didn't view people of color as equals as they enslaved Africans. And so as we approach the quasi-centennial of the first 19 or so Negroes brought as indentured servants and then converted into perpetual enslavement by the recodification of British common law. British common law says that you inherit your status from your father, primogenitor. But that wouldn't work to enslave people in perpetuity, so they changed the law in the, eight, in the 1660s to say that you, you as Africans, only Africans, divide your rights from your mother's status who is enslaved. Thus, our founding fathers were flawed in many ways. <coughs> and because of that, I believe with you, Dr. Monte, we have to redefine what America is. Because the red, white, and blue on this flag, I think mostly symbolizes the white and the colorism. Yesterday, James Fields was convicted of what, 13 counts, and then there are more counts to come. James Fields is the white nationalist who drove from Ohio. Shout, shout. He drove from Ohio to Charlottesville to participate in an anti-people of color, anti-women, anti-everything bigoted display of white power. As he left Ohio, his mother said, well, be careful. He said, no, they need to be careful. Because in his perverted view, of America, held by James uh, Richard Spencer and Jason Kessler, dishonorable graduates of the University of Virginia, who are still free, by the way. They believe that this country was founded for and by white people. And therefore, the definition, Brother Seal, is that America is white and should be white. And they would even argue that they aren't bigoted. They just want a white nation on the false science that white people are different genetically than any of us in this room. So, our founding fathers were flawed. The Universal Declaration in 1948 is brilliantly written, but hardly ever enforced. So, my 30 years of experience in civil and human rights advocacy in this country and around the world has placed me in at the knees of some of the most brilliant minds we've produced. Two of them, uh, Reverend Jesse Jackson Sr., who studied directly under Dr. Martin Luther King Jr., and Dr. Dorothy Irene Height, who was born here in Richmond, Virginia, and went on to inherit the organization, the National Council of Negro Women, from Mrs. Mary McLeod Bethune. Those two impacted me in, in very many ways, but as the Declaration states, free from fear and want. Well, Dr. King said in his 1967 speech at the Riverside Baptist Church in New York, one year to the day before, he, one year to the day before he was assassinated, he said that the United States is the greatest purveyor of violence on the planet. Redefinitions. Dr. Dorothy Height, 
worked under Mrs. Bethune, who worked directly with Eleanor, First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt, who was a driving force behind the Declaration, free from fear and want. And Sister Lana, I really love that poem. And if I could have a, a copy, I would love to read it on my radio show, The Gary Flowers Show, tomorrow. <laughs> home is not home if it's, a, if it's a shark's mouth. And so we have to redefine America. Upset. We have to redefine what home is. Because if we are all human beings, one race, of humankind, then home is our third rock from the sun. It's all of our home. That's what home is. And so the balkanization of artificial lines of demarcation, countries and continents, is unhomelike because it's false. Redefinitions. Uh, and Sister Kate, you're so right on the idea of networks. I was a beneficiary of a village, a well-educated village, a well-connected village, um, a prosperous village, relatively middle class. Uh, no one was really rich, but we thought we were. Uh, and so networks matter. But as I've said on the Gary Flowers show, it takes a village to raise a child. That's the African proverb. But Lana, violent rape oriented villages raise those types of people. Say so, um, villages that look down on people for their differences breed the bigotry that comes out of that. And so we have to define, redefine America, we have to redefine home. And our challenge from Richmond, Virginia is to open the keyhole through which we view the world now and look at the broad expanse of the centrality of Virginia in American and world history. The centrality of Richmond in Virginia's history. So when we celebrate the, or commemorate the, the quacentennial that, that's coming, right now I'm seeing the word American evolution. That's the phrase mm -hmm. you all may have seen. There. Raise your hand right. if you've seen it. <laughs> What does that mean? Yeah. <laughs> what in the world does that mean? So I'm looking at the board of advisors, the blackboard. Who's on it? Nobody that makes any sense. <laughs> I thought I was the but, only one. But maybe Dr. Lonnie Bunch, I mean, Mr. Lonnie Bunch, he is the director of the African American uh, Museum in Washington, D.C., Smithsonian. And he has grown into being a historian, but he's not a trained historian. Who, the question is, who's missing? If the 19 or so Negroes were brought from the West Africa and the continent of Africa, why aren't there any African mm -hmm. scholars That's on, right. on the panel? Thank you. Boom shakalaka? You okay. just started so. Why aren't there any women historians of color mm -hmm. on that panel? Mm -hmm. You know why? Because who defines Virginia's role is Dominion Energy. Ooh. And I'll treat her. And the other upside down viewers of what this country is to be. So the tyranny of forward. wealth. And so we have to redefine. That's our challenge. We have to redefine mm -hmm. our networks. We have to redefine what home is. Mm -hmm. We have to redefine how we pervertedly look at difference as deficiency. And Dr. Monte, we have to redefine the core and essence of the Declaration. And as we do so, we will not only change this city and change this commonwealth, but we will change the nation and the world. So thank you very much. Close to lunch, we have about uh, 15 yeah, minutes for some questions. If anybody needs to stretch, there is coffee. Restrooms are around to the right. Uh, Monte is going to field a few questions, uh, and then we're going to get ready for lunch and 
Seymour, are you going to you're going to talk a little bit during lunch, right? Thank you very much. We want to hear about that. And uh, af after the question and answer, uh, Umar wants to say a few words. But I want to let's do the questions first. Okay. You want to field a few questions? And yeah. Comments. Um, <clears throat> I want to allow time for some q and I'm bringing the mic up to the table. We've got three great uh, mm. panelists along with the remarks of Mr. Flowers. Mm. Uh, yes, sir. I have one question. It might be redundant. I'm trying to find a better word for immigrant and refugee. What can it be? I have one answer that I'll suggest, and you all may have others too, but my answer is like using people first language. People who are immigrants, people who are refugees, you know, people of color, people from our community, people who have been economically challenged, people who have disabilities. Use that people first language, and I think that that helps to humanize the conversation. Excellent. That's it. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Uh, yes, sir. Hi, um, I'm Charles Rabideau. Um, the uh, couple of comments. The Richmond paper this morning has an article, U.S. intensifies its opposition to, to migration pact. Now, that of course refers to the so-called global compact for safe, orderly, and regular migration. And um, th this relates to everything that we've heard today, um, because what this pact it, it would attempt to do is to put some order and, and, and humanity into the process of refugees and migrants, which we've heard so much today about. And um, the United States, is opposing this, predictably. And uh, yesterday, our government put out so-called National Statement of the United States of America on the adoption of the Global Compact for Safe, Orderly, and Regular Migration. And uh, I don't know what the meaning of national statement is. That apparently intends to commit all of us to this, to the, the opposition to this. And what this involves also, Gary speaks about we need to redefine America. <coughs> what we need to do also is to prevent the redefinition of America down, That's it. which That's is it. what is now going on. And one, one element of this statement, national statement, so-called, um, It speaks of children. One of the things that the Global Compact would do would be to commit nations to all of the, although it would not have the force of law, but it would commit them morally to support all of the statements that have come about over recent years, including the statement on the rights of the child. The United States does not accept that. But this statement, national statement, says the compact suggests the best interest of the child must always be the primary consideration rather than a prime that but, but rather than a primary consideration while the united states takes into account the best interests of the child this is not always the primary consideration in the immigration context it is the sovereign right of nations to determine how to detain minors humanely in the immigration context in accordance with national laws and policies subject to their international obligations. 
That's a very high sounding statement of law. Think about that in terms of people that we've heard about today. Uh, any question? Um, no. I'm sorry to stand up and not make and ask a question. Okay, what are you going to do about it? Yeah. All right, uh, based, based on those very wise words, any reactions from the panelists? I don't want to take That's away uh, my point from the panelists. Uh, any reactions? All right, thank you for those very wise words. Uh, yes, sir. Just, just supporting what Charles was saying, I think the distinction is between what we might consider versus what we're able to implement. And I think if we are in a situation where we're just brainstorming, that that leads to a number of different things. But when you come up with some certain definitive points, if you want to move the needle forward, you have to figure out how to implement legislation or laws to be able to address those very issues that Charles was bringing up. And so it's indicative on our part to have to stay involved with our community, our political leaders, and try to let them know that there is more than just one way of thinking about this world. Even though we only get one point of view from our elected legislatures and our media, depending on the media you're looking at, each individual story does have more than one way of looking. Mm -hmm. All right, here, here. Yes, uh, amen to that. Other, uh, other folks or? Mm -hmm. Any other um, questions? Uh, yes, sir. Yeah, I'm Ms. Harris, can you tell us a little bit about the uh, community mentors? What, uh, what, how do you identify them? How do they come into being? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, one of the needs that um, we've kind of seen arise um, for the refugee and immigrant community is this need for, for people who are native-born here, people who've been here a little bit longer, to walk alongside those who are new. Um, and different organizations have different kinds of mentorship programs. Reestablish Richmond, we're an organization that focuses on um, resettlement uh, in the long term. So we have resettlement agencies like the ones that seem helps to support um, initially and then um, for longer periods of time. We have a volunteer program where we train people to become mentors, we pair them with a refugee family who might just need a little bit of assistance navigating life here. All right, uh, I've got time for a couple more questions or, or if people just want to share, I suppose. Uh, yes, yes, miss? Um, so I'm, a, I'm actually under the technical definition. I'm an immigrant although I do not look like today's current immigrant. And I'm also a mentor, as she just mentioned. I started shopping with Bhutanese and Nepalese women, navigating just an average grocery store, because we go from, in, in Ireland where I grew up, we maybe had 400 to 800 products, and you go into the average grocery store, and Aldi has 1,100, and I think that's one of the small ones. Um, but I just wanted to make uh, two very short points comments on each one of the speakers. Um, the first point was, I really enjoyed how you opened the, um, the focus today with setting an intention or a purpose or a mission, and I wanted to just bring that back for each one of us to think about. It's kind of like I'm giving homework for myself, at least, and hopefully you'll join me. In, in focusing um, uh, on Monday, which is the 10th, which is the anniversary of the Universal uh, Declaration of Human Rights, chaired by Eleanor Roosevelt. Um, the intention was set that we bring that great big universal uh, program into a very focused uh, Central Virginia and Richmond uh, intention. So how can each one of us do that? And early on, we mentioned Bernie Sanders, and one of his planks in his presidential one was uh, he appealed to the millennials by donating, uh, I think it was, and I'm going to get the number wrong, $27. That's now gone up. Each person could donate $27 for his presidential run, 
and now they're figuring in 2019, if that was to happen again, it would be $35. But I think the bigger point was each one of us has a stake in that. And what can we personally do as individuals and as groups um, whether you're an immigrant who's been here, say, 35, 40 years, like myself, um, or you've been here, your, your family and yourself have been here for 250 or more years. So thinking about that intention. The other thing that I wanted to mention is, um, I think in the last couple of years, we're learning more and more about implicit bias and stigma. And one of the questions that I have for the panel and each one of us to think about is, um, it sounds to me, and I don't want to assume, that all of us in the room uh, came today with a faith base, a Judeo-Christian Islamic base of some kind, where there's the universal tenet of the golden rule. And I think um, we're all implicitly thinking that, uh, we learn that, whether we're in fact Christians now, or Jews now, or Muslims now, we grew up in that. And the challenge that I wanted to say is clearly the next generation of millennials, um, and even people outside of that marketing definition, are what we call nuns. And they no longer have that faith base. So the two points that were mentioned was the vulnerability of women and children um, and predatory behaviors when you immigrate or whether you've been um, not equally represented at the table that our founding fathers represented. And number two, um, that, uh, oh, I just, what's the second point? Help me out. Vulnerability for children and uh, when, you, when you talk about, oh, the, the neighbor, the welcome okay. guest. So I sit in a pew every week, or I visit seven to, um, I homeschool my family, so I'm in seven to ten worship centers every week, ranging from a, a temple, or a, I'm a Catholic by uh, birth, and uh, a devout, passionate, modern Catholic now. Um, mm -hmm. So I hear these messages all the time, and yet when I talk to people that were born, <coughs> Before say 19, uh, before and after 1980, when when you tell them that one of the most highly publicized, you know, if if Jesus, Mary, and Joseph had a PR campaign, they were probably the first documented well-known refugee when they flip when they had to flee to Egypt. This is a radical concept to the generation that my children currently live in. So when we as adults are sitting down at the table and mapping out our, our new game plan, if you will, the next generation is not going to understand wow, some fun. of the things that we implicitly have grown up with, regardless of what your, your race, your color, your creed, mm -hmm. your ethnicity. These are challenges that yeah. you all certainly are probably already facing in the trenches. So how can we address that, number one? And number two, we have the onus on us, just like Martin Luther King Jr. had, to reach down and lift them up without stigma and without judgment. Thank you. So I'm mindful of the time, but uh, it's noon right now. Or are we good for lunch, or should we keep going? With the Hopefully, on the way. Did you, anybody want to comment, respond to her remarks? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, kind of question. <laughs> All right, we've got some more time for Q&A. Q &A. Maybe see. And thank you, because the Abrahamic religion have a lot of fundamentals that crisscross among all three. You're absolutely right, because I have children in that group and I'm struggling. So you're absolutely right, but I'm hoping that Abrahamic religion is not simply faith alone, but it injects culture into our behavior and our history. So the identity issue, which is so critical, the only thing I can pass to my kids, and, and I'm a Catholic, and, and obviously that isn't going very well with my kids, but. But what I can do is that identity 
of the cultural link to the Abrahamic religion is my hope. The faith, uh, they might come back, but right now they're not. And I'm hoping that Abrahamic religion is also a cultural link and the behavioral that we have shown them by act that you have suggested is the only theology I can pass to my kids. But you're absolutely right. This group here and the next generation are going to have a very different world view. Some good, some maybe not so. So the cultural link is all I'm hoping for. I guess I would just add that one of the things that religion seeks to teach all of us, uh, and you don't have to actually have faith in a particular deity for this to be the case, is to give us a set of common values. And so those values are what can be passed on, and it might be with the language of faith, but it might just be with human language, too. Um, so I don't think that um, having a generation of nuns means that we have to lose those values. It's just one way of talking about them. And I have to leave, so I'm so sorry, uh, but it's been really great to be with you all this morning. Thank you. Uh, yeah, uh, Dr. Hillier in the back. Uh, I can't resist uh, using this occasion to try to fill in a historical blank. Uh, at the beginning of our session, we saw the list of dates having to do with uh, decisions about uh, immigration in, in, in U.S. history and how you have to beginning if you were a white person you needed to live in the country for two years before you could become a citizen and so on. Uh, three years ago in the summer I had some uh, visitors from out of the country and we went to New York and for the first time in, uh, gosh, 45 years I took the tour of Ellis Island, maybe you've done that, it's extremely interesting. And of course from there you can see the Statue of Liberty, you know, bring me your tired report and so on. Uh, well, when you take that tour, uh, there are good guides and there are all sorts of, uh, you know, uh, there's all sorts of written information on the wall, so you get a sense of the history of, of immigration, which was very intensive in the second half of the 19th century and up until 1925. And at the time, the immigrants who came were virtually all from, uh, from Europe, you know, there were the waves of Italians, uh, mostly from southern Italy, there were Jews, and there were other Eastern Europeans who were who were coming there were the Irish who were met with uh, you know hostility uh, from all time when they first came to uh, to this to this country. In any event, I don't recall whether uh, there's any explanation there at Ellis Island as to why suddenly by law all of this came to a a, a screeching halt in 1925. Okay, uh, and it did. And a year ago, I read a book, and this was news to me. I certainly hadn't heard about it in high school. Uh, be, it came to a halt because of the success of the eugenics movement in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, you know, this was a, there was a hierarchy of races and ethnic groups and so on, and there was this this widespread belief that you know uh, Italians, and Jews, and Eastern Europeans, and Irish and so on were were genetically inferior, and we were we were uh, you know contaminating the race by allowing these waves of immigration. And that's 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 why it came to an end. And this this movement, interestingly enough, and I I'd known about it, but hadn't known much about it. The eugenics movement had a tremendous influence on the Nazis in Germany. Yes. You know, the, 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 there were you know so it's of of Hitler who were in touch with uh, ex so so called eugenics experts in the United <coughs> States. Final story I'll tell you. you may, probably heard about when you were in school, the story of Sacco and Vanzetti, these two Italian immigrants who were accused <coughs> falsely of committing a terrorist act. They were they belonged to an anarchist group and there was some kind of terrorist act. People died, died and there was a, 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 a trial. Now, what people now think and many people thought at the time was that Sacco and Vanzetti, they were anarchists and they might have actually participated in, in some, some murders and so on. That's unknown, but they probably did not commit this particular terrorist act. Well, their execution was postponed for several years because there was an outcry, uh, mostly in Europe, about this, uh, you know, this miscarriage of justice. Well, they were finally uh, executed in 1925, uh, I think. Uh, in any event, at the time, somebody said, 
to the president of Harvard, whose name I now forget, well, you know, this is probably a miscarriage of justice. And the guy said, well, it really doesn't matter because they're animals anyway. Okay, yeah. so they were highly educated people who bought into, uh, you know, eugenics. Uh, and, and that sort of, all that got discredited because of what happened, Holocaust and so on in World War II. But it's always possible that, that this will come back and, and in effect, Trump and, you know, the, He's a kind of eugenicist without probably knowing what the knowing about that historical business or even what the word means. Uh, thank you, Dr. Hilliard, for um, that warning. Uh, yes. Sorry, I don't want to take up too much time. I'm Anjum Ali, and I'm on the committee to help with the United Nations. Um, affiliation here, but I just wanted to say something about the issue when you brought up the, the nons and the uh, millennial generation, <coughs> etc. And I think that this is exactly why something like creating a chapter here is so critical because there's a couple of things that are, I mean, multiple things that are going on in the community. The interfaith work is another big one because I will say this one of the problems we're having with youth, especially in Western countries. Uh, and I, I apologize if I'm just kind of using those simplistic terms right now, is that um, they're not understanding that still majority of the world operates on a faith-based mentality. And that's a huge disconnect. So what I'm not trying to say is that we need to, you know, force our children into understanding and younger generations to understand that you have to have a faith and you have to have a faith identity. Right. But at minimum, if they can't cra grasp the concept that everybody in such so many countries around the world, way more than the few Western countries are operating on that level, this is a problem. It's a huge problem. Mm -hmm. And so for that reason, interfaith efforts here help people and younger generations see um, the value of faith because unfortunately that religions have done a great job of ruin it for themselves. Yeah. Okay. That's right. <laughs> yeah. So the work that's done in Richmond I've seen is really great. And number two, the United Nations and creating that kind of identity with um, this uh, uh, a sense of globalness as well as values in the Declaration of Human Rights is part of that, bringing those common values back together. So on both levels. So I, I really hope you guys will, um, and I think Marty uh, is going to mention this right now, but we'll pre uh, become members and we have the papers back there to show how you become members. That's that homework that you're talking about. That would be the homework we're asking you. Guys. Right. Yeah. Oh, we're we're going to have to wrap up. Yeah. Thank you, Gary, for coming. Uh, we're, gonna, we're, gonna, we're getting ready for lunch. The food should be here mm -hmm. shortly, hopefully. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if not, Again, we like to thank each panelist in terms of uh, you taking them from your very busy schedule to be a part of this today. We have truly have been informed and enlightened <coughs> by your work. And we really appreciate you in terms of uh, support uh, for this endeavor. At, at this time, I'd like to bring the uh, coordinating committees. Will you please come forward, please? I just want to let, let the audience know in terms of uh, uh, your contribution to make this program possible. I could just stand up. No, no, I want them to come forward, please. <laughs> come forward, please. Let's come forward. Yeah. Joel. Thank you. Thank you. Charles. Let's go. Let's go. All right, we're okay. Well, Nancy, 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 would you come forward, please? This is the coordinating group, obviously, mm -hmm. that has been so instrumental in mm -hmm. terms of making not only this particular program, but the other programs of which yeah. we have put forth as, yeah. as a, want to come? No, no, just say thank you. Oh, okay, well, thank you, sir. Hey, you want to get a group so picture while I'm up here? You want to get a group picture while I'm up here? <laughs> okay, well, that's, yeah. a, that's, a, that's, a, that's, a, that's a whole other panel. That's, I mean, what I'm saying, these are the experts in terms of making this happen. But I just want to know the working group that has actually been a part the coordination support of this endeavor are actually making the UN alive in the city of Richmond. Mm -hmm. I just wanted a couple of things I want to uh, convey. One of them being, this is the Congress. This is the Congress as it relates to the High Commission on Refugees that's an integral part of the United Nations. Now what the vision is, is that we as organizers will have different groupings relative to 
what are the issues that are being worked on in Richmond. So we're hopefully that you as um, service providers, can, we can identify a time where we can all get together and develop some kind of strategic plan that would speak both to the local government and the state government in terms of what our constituency think around immigration and the issues of refugees in this part of the world. Is that okay? Yeah. I mean, let's read something very quick. If you can read, if you can say with me, give me your target. Let me hear that. Give me your target. Your poor. Your poor. Your Herbert. Your huddle masses, your huddle masses. Yearning, to be free. yearning to be free. The wretched refuse of your team at shore. Let's say it, let's say it, let's say it like we mean it. Let's say it like we mean it. Give me your target. Give me your target. Your poor, your hurdle masses, yearning to be free. The wretched refuse. Of your team is sure. A little bit better. Give me your target. Give me your poor. Give me your herd masses. Yearning to be free. The wretched refuse of your team is sure. I say that to reaffirm that we must walk with authority if we're going to engage on this level of global engagement as it relates to refugees and immigration. We are walking with authority on that. Are we not? Yes. yes. Are we walking with authority on that? Amen. All right. Very good. <laughs> and the other part of that is what is the homework assignment? The very first thing we need to do is contact our congressman as it relates to the United States leaving the High Commissions of Human Rights. We must let our government know that this constituency in the epic center of America called Richmond, Virginia, Thank you. wishes to have reinstatement of our American <laughs> government as, as a part of the High Commission on Human Rights. Right. Is that okay? Yes. yes. Secondly, we must, as we say, this is to Congress now as it relates to Virginia's <coughs> role in immigration and refugee rights. We will hope that you will continue to stay focused on that and hopefully we, come, we can develop a strategic, a strategic plan. Coming to a conference and workshops is one thing, but getting to work on the efforts, that's a whole other thing. Can we, can we agree with that? Yes. Yeah. Okay, second. Now the vision is to have this group connected to the High Commissioner on Human Refugees. That's a part, integral part of the United Nations. Now what we would like to do is have, in order to move this forward, you must become a member of the United Nations Association, which is only $25. And what is the, the cost for the... Uh, and free for you. Free, free for you. Students. students are free. Exactly. So with that being in mind, we are hoping that once we get the number of individuals, we will become an authorized chapter, which basically means we have connections and we hope to take a visit to the United Nations itself to familiarize ourselves with the work of the United Nations so we can speak intelligently and speak diplomatically because this is the process of citizen diplomacy. Now I <coughs> took offense in terms of certain comments were made by this flag. Now as a part of this process, this is not, hopefully this will never happen again. We are an integral part of the American reality. We are an integral part in terms of our status and the system of the United Nations. We are diplomats, regardless of what our portfolio says. We are diplomats. And so being, we would hold our standard of who we are as American citizens very high. Very high. Uh, I, don't, I, I know many of us come from different backgrounds of activists, of activism, rather, but to disrespect and have disregard for this symbol Go. Which well, is it, Brother Omar, if you don't mind my adding. Yeah, yeah, or, finish, please. Oh, yeah, sure. Mm -hmm. I'll just come add on, to me right on, after. Please, please go, go ahead. ahead. Go ahead. Uh, well, I just wanted to say that our mission with this chapter is also to reach across aisles. That's right. So we want to make sure that we're also mm -hmm. appealing to everybody because it is about common values and human yeah. rights. So 
uh, as much as everybody definitely has their feelings and their perspectives yes. and their experiences, and we cannot deny those ever. Yes. But at the same time, we do want to make sure that people always are going to feel safe and yes. welcome at our events. You know, that's critical for all of all us. Right. Yeah, thank, thank you. For that. All right, that'll work. Well, it stands, well, it, well as it relates to that, uh, I'm not, I think uh, if I understand what you're saying, I just want us to understand that the <coughs> principles in which we stand are rooted in our freedom as Americans to even address this and be engaged in this. I think that needs to be understood because it's not just our generation. It's young, and we are leaving the footprint and the DNA, the social engagement DNA for another generation. I just want to be very clear on that. As I indicated, we are working to have a relationship with a UN refugee agent, which is called the UN High Commission for Refugees. We need persons to actually engage that, to be that conduit, to make that happen and to let the United Nations know that in Richmond, we have this kind of activities going at this present time. But that being said, again, I want to thank you and on behalf of all our coordinators and members in terms of being a part of this, and we leave you with this, that please, if what, you've, if what you have received here today, if it stimulates you in terms of being engaged globally as, as it relates to uh, many issues, not only this particular one that has global intent, that we ask you please to become a member and be a part uh, of this great renewal that's going on in Richmond, Virginia. Okay? Thank you again. Um, just a little housekeeping. Uh, we need to reorganize the tables so we can sit around them for lunch. So the tables need to be set at a diagonal. Take your time. Okay, um, my name is Seema Sked. I, um, I went to the border. I just got home yesterday, so forgive me, this is going to be really raw and dirty. Um, so a little bit about me. I was born in Pakistan. I came here when I was a baby. Um, I am a U.S. citizen. It's only because my parents had means. Um, they were not fleeing persecution. They just wanted a good life for us children. Um, the reason I went is because I see myself in those kids, and I see, I see my nieces and nephews in those kids. I was completely prepared to stand in between Border Patrol and children I had a backpack, I was in Charlottesville, so I was prepared um, with a medic bag and all sorts of things that you need. Didn't know exactly where I would be stationed. Um, but that's just a little bit about me. Um, never been to Mexico before. So I arrived in Tijuana and um, didn't know really what to expect. Um, I'm brown, I'm a citizen, kind of keeps me safe some places, not safe other places, because the passport does say born in Pakistan, so take that as you will. I'll just put a disclaimer out there, I was a volunteer, not representing any organization, and all that good stuff, so <clears throat> let's get started. Um, I did visit Benito Juarez a few days ago, well, maybe a week ago now. It was closed due to torrential rains. It's basically an outdoor complex that's got gates around it. There's a lot of children that were there. A lot of, it's basically uninhabitable. 
when we got there, we couldn't go through the gates. But everything we saw before, there were streets full of people living in tents. There were children playing in sewer water. It was surrounded by a lot of military, a lot of government officials, Mexican officials, a lot of guns, a lot, a lot, a lot of guns. Um, a tank of some sort, I don't know. Um, basically, we were there to observe, see what was going on, and watch our backs. The reason the people are there is because they and for their children's lives. The majority of them thousands and thousands and thousands of miles. Take your time. These are human beings that are treated as less than. The only difference between us and them is geography. Where were we born? That's all. That's the only difference. A new shelter or camp was opened up. It is a four hour walk from Benito Juarez. It is in a very remote, very dangerous part of Tijuana. I did not visit there um, because it was too dangerous and because they already had a team there and also because the people I traveled with said they didn't have a way to get us out if something bad happened. So for that reason, I didn't go. Um, but conditions there, not really much food, water, no electricity. If you even make it there, that is. Um, people that get there try to come back to Benito Juarez. <coughs> and um, the people there aren't, aren't happy with people living in the streets next to the school where their kids go to school. People showed up in the middle of the night with pipes, trying to get rid of the folks there, disregard for their children. I'm sorry, I just, I just got back and I wasn't really prepared and like I said, this is pretty raw. Um, my purpose of going um, was basically to do anything I could to help. There was a legal team there that was basically trying to explain how to apply for asylum. There's an entryway where you see this big colorful sign that says Mexico and Tijuana. People stand there in a line and wait for the name to be called on this list. This list that people wait five, six weeks for their names to be called. This list, there's 5,000 people on the list right now. That's really nothing compared to how many more people are coming. People are standing in line, not really knowing what's going to happen when they cross the border. They don't know that their children are going to be taken from them immediately. They're being thrown. I'm not going to call them detention centers. They're concentration camps. There is, they're not getting out, not anytime soon. And so our purpose there was to try to counsel them and help them 
in any way that we could. So I'm just gonna, I'm gonna just cut to the stuff that I saw personally. Um, standing in line, there was a woman with her three children who was having a panic attack and crying and couldn't calm down because she thought she would mess up her interview with a border agent. I, along with um, one of my team members, who's a trained therapist, tried to talk to her in ways to calm herself down. She had recently seen her husband murdered in front of her and her kids, and all she was worried about is messing up her interview. While my team member tried to calm her down, I just tried to distract the kids, put a little smile on their face. They looked scared. I tried to pretend I didn't know what the colors were in Spanish and distract them and ask them, how do you say this in Spanish? This is how you say it in English. Just little things like that. There was, there was a group of people that were escaping persecution because they had different <coughs> political views. Groups of folks fleeing because they were the wrong color. Being put into mass graves because of it. We were talking to a gentleman, and he was explaining that all their stories were pretty much the same. We told him that he would be put in detention, and that look on his face, seeing a grown man cry. And he's like, why? I didn't do anything wrong. And I just put my hand on his shoulder and said, there are so many people. Take your time. There are so many people on the outside fighting for you. While you're in there, don't forget that. And tell everybody else that there are people on the outside fighting for you. There was an office that we operated out of. It was basically a building that was all staffed by volunteers. They fed people there. They took donations there. Some people slept there. I remember being in the office and being called outside for something urgent. There was a woman whose face was cut and bleeding with her children, with a very pregnant family member. She was in one of the shelters, and she escaped because her partner had tried to kill her. And then one of their family members found out and attacked her, which is why her face was cut and bleeding. She and her kids needed to get out of there. So we were gonna accompany them to get their, I'm not gonna say safety, to get there somewhere safer. And all I remember is we couldn't get a stupid Uber because we couldn't get a connection. And so we had to put them in a cab that didn't have room for us and we're carrying everything they have, and I had a pack of diapers under my arm. And we put it curbside next to the taxi, and I walked away, and I almost forgot to give them their diapers. 
And all I can think about is, where the hell are they going to get more diapers? Like I said, not one person that I talked to said, I'm just here because I thought America was a cool place to go. I want an education. I want a good job. Not one. Not one. Everyone was escaping. I've got many more stories, but let me just uh, try to end with, with one. Actually, let me back up and end with one. <clears throat> I guess leave this saddest one for last. Um, one of the aspects of working in the base office was giving them legal counsel and making sure they had documentation. You think making copies isn't really a big deal here? People don't print things out because everything's electronic. But when you make a copy of a birth certificate that's been folded and crumpled up and wet from traveling in the rain, you do your damn best to make sure you don't destroy it. I still have my birth certificate from Pakistan. It is a small, faded, thin piece of paper. And it is all I have showing the country from where I was born. <clears throat> the last thing I'll leave you with is there is this baby. There's always a story with a baby with me. I love babies. I saw one of my team members holding a baby, just looking completely distraught. And I thought, the first thing I thought is, how did this baby get here? There's no parents, there's, there's nobody around. This is one of those cases where somebody just brought a baby over to try to save their lives. There was a mom, she couldn't even hold it in. She couldn't hold her own child. She was so upset. Then they passed the baby to me. Go ahead, take your time. And this sweet, beautiful baby that was only a couple months old was wrapped in this little blanket, and all I could do was sing him lullabies that I would sing to my nieces and nephews. <coughs> and say some prayers over him. And when he woke up, he just looked at me with this confused look on his face like, who is this lady holding me? And I passed him back over to his mother when my team member got her calmed down enough. And then I just saw them sitting on the curb waiting for their number to be called. That baby could have been my niece or nephew. That baby could have been me. And I will remember that sweet face for the rest of my life. You did good. Thank you. Thank you for sharing.
a difficult story. Thank you for having the courage and caring to go down there. I always thought more of us should be doing more, and you're one of the people that does it, that goes down there. And I think that's amazing and an inspiration. You know, we, we should have thousands of people at the border helping those people, government officials processing those people immediately, not making them wait six hours to get, you know, and, and gassing them. I mean, it's absurd when people are fleeing uh, poverty and violence to be treated like criminals. So it's an indictment. Of, of our government, the Mexican government, the whole world that we're, we sit by and let those kinds of things happen. Well, I don't know what happened to the food. I don't see any food. <laughs> I mean, we did pay for food, so I don't know, maybe I can get my money back. <laughs> but, thank you, thank you, thank you. Joel, did you hear anything about the food? Do you see any food on the way? You want to look out there? Just look in the hallway, see if you see any food on the way. <laughs> we'll just see if, you, if Umar is out there, if there's any uh, possibility of us having lunch. <laughs> What's happening, Umar, with the food? The place. Exactly. About five minutes away. Five minutes away. The food is five minutes away. So if you want to wait for five minutes. Uh... How many are there? They have been arriving for months. They will continue to arrive for many, many many months and right now ice concentration camps are releasing folks to make room to jail more people those folks are being shipped all around the country with nothing their efforts in Richmond to provide them with coats and food and some medical supplies on their stop from here to wherever they end up going. And those are the lucky ones. Some of them have ankle monitors, but still, those are the lucky ones. So this is an ongoing issue. This is not a one-time a one -time thing. There is a caravan each and every year and the purpose of having a caravan is because it's safer for the women and children to travel in large groups so far as I know, the folks that do attempt to cross the border, the only way to apply for asylum is you come across the border and say, I want to apply for asylum. As soon as you cross the border, your kids are stolen from you and you're put it into a concentration camp. You have really no connection to people on the outside. So if you can't plead your case and get out or communicate with anybody, you get deported, your kids are still here, and your kids are being sold into a foster care system. Children are disappearing. It's a lot of human trafficking. A lot of young girls go missing. We know exactly what that means. It will continue to happen. Families will continue to be separated. So 
You can't exactly trust everything you see on the news. Hopefully you guys believe me because I saw it firsthand. There's a lot of great organizations that are on the ground trying to help. But no, trying to send supplies, they're being confiscated. Trying to send money, it's being confiscated. One of the things you can do is to get money into the hands of the people that are already there, not just recently, but have been doing work at the border for many, 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 many years. And again, I said I'm just a volunteer, but one great organization to support that's on the ground is Al Otro Lado, means the other side. They coordinated volunteers from all across the country. I think there were some from outside the states that were there. So I encourage you to donate to them. I encourage you to call every elected official and tell them to show up down there. If me, an unemployed activist, can get off my butt and go to the damn border, they can be brave enough to show up and not just visit a detention facility and take a tour like it's some museum or like it's a zoo and not be surrounded by agents to protect them and watch their backs and to actually perhaps go to the border land on the other side and walk into this country next to them. There are efforts. There's a sanctuary coalition that is doing some sort of that thing right now. I'm not exactly sure specifics. I just wanted to go as soon as I had an opportunity. Honestly, I don't know if I could handle going again, but that's something to look into if you so choose, but no, you have zero protection, zero. And you will probably get hit by tear gas if you're lucky, if you're not a rubber bullet. Or you might not make it back, honestly, so. Sorry to be so grim, but that's what it is. I mean, that's the reality, so. Thank you. I noticed the food actually has started to arrive. Betsy, did you want to make a comment? Surely. I need the microphone because I'm soft-spoken. Uh, I'm Betsy Brinson. I just want to follow up on the local effort. Seema mentioned um, putting them on buses and send, they're in the deportation process, but they're sending them on buses and it's actually happened uh, last week here in Richmond. We got noticed locally through ICE uh, out of RVA and a couple of the other sanctuary groups that without any notice, here are two mothers and six children who are at the Greyhound bus station and they have no money. They're trying to get to Fredericksburg for, to catch up with extended family and could anybody pick them up and go? And we have a transportation network through the sanctuary movement. Um, and I'm, I'm telling you this because we could use some more drivers. We could use some more people who have some Spanish. You go as a team, a couple. So you've got one Spanish speaker and one driver. And you help each other out. In this case, somebody did respond within about eight hours and got this these two families to their family in Fredericksburg. We also use regular drivers now, and the caseload is increasing rapidly. These are people who live in the area, who um, have been told they're going to be deported, but if they check in every so often, usually on a monthly basis, um, because 
the final result of deportation in the appeal process is likely to take a long time. It's not hard driving at all. Again, we work as a team. We have one person who is a Spanish speaker. We have one person who's the driver. In my case, I'm the driver. You pick people up. You take them to the office on Midlothian. It works well. They're not in there more than about 30 minutes, and you're out, and you've got them back home. Most of them live off of Jefferson Davis, but there's no bus system out in Jefferson Davis, so and they have no transportation. So especially some of you younger people, you know, if you're students and you don't have a lot of time to put into this and you're a licensed driver, you have some Spanish background, you know, we could really use you at this point. So if you're interested in that, see me afterwards and I'll tell you how to connect. She got her hand back on. Thank you, Betsy. It's nice to know people are trying and doing some good work. She got her hand back on. That's up. wonderful. If we have a few more hands up here. Thank you for sharing that info. Um, there's another effort. You have to be carefully vetted, but people that are actually released from ICE detention, sent to friends, family members, showing up on buses, on the way to wherever they're going into the country, there's been over a thousand right now that we're just trying to catch, like you try to catch people in between flights. We're trying to catch them in between buses. So that's a rapid response thing. You can contact me if you want more info for that. But um, if you think about folks arriving in the dead of summer, it's pretty darn cold now. Some people don't have socks. Kids don't have anything to play with. Some kids have been in the same diaper for days. People haven't had a warm meal in God knows how long. People haven't had a comforting word God knows how long. And if kids had something like a piece of paper and a crayon, that would make their whole day. So that's another way to get involved. Well, the food is ready. Uh, something quickly. I was quickly. saying that um, both Betsy and Seema, if we could uh, get the information out to everybody, we will do it electronically so that everybody will have this. Everybody here, and who he was here, will have the same piece mm. of information. I think Andrew will help with that as well. Well, why don't we get started with lunch? All right. Let us bow our heads. Mm -hmm. Father, Mother, God, we thank you for this day so far, for rising in the sun, and have allowed us to get a little bit more humane at this time of the season. We ask, dear Lord, that you come now. Mm -hmm. You fire the food up. You bless it and the hands that prepared it. You give us mm -hmm. the type of conversation that will help to move the process further. All these we ask in the mighty and matchless name of the God who formed us in the beginning and brought us to this hour. Let the people of God say, Amen. Amen. Amen.